Welcome to Europe ECR 2023. My name is Nieves Gonzalo. I'm an interventional cardiologist working in Madrid, Hospital Clinico San Carlos. And I have the pleasure of being here today with Jerome Sunk, interventional cardiologist working in Alst, uh, Belgium. And we're going to be discussing a little bit about the management of uh, calcific disease, which is actually one of the hot topics in the Congress this year. Yep. I, yeah, well, yes, thank you for the invitation. I think it's really a hot and trending topic. Um, it remains one of the most challenging uh, subsets of patients that we treat on a daily basis. And uh, I think that you agree that we very often underestimate the calcific burden. Um, and well, during the sessions, I made a, a bit of a parallel even with the, the brain surgeons that never go to surgery without imaging. And I have the impression that when we rely only on the, let's say, basic conventional angiography, that we're not as good prepared as we should be, because we're treating the coronaries, which is, uh, well, if it goes wrong, it's a lethal uh, situation. And I think that we have to be prepared. And this is one of my personal favorite topics in, in the preparation of treatment of calcific disease. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I fully agree. I think actually evaluation of uh, calcium by angiography is very limited. It can tell you that there is some calcium. That's the maximum you can you can say by angiography. Sometimes it's, it's clear there is severe calcium, but even in those cases, it's very difficult to understand the type of calcium, the pattern of the calcium, and how it's going to behave. So definitely, all the modalities are, are important uh, to evaluate the, the calcium. And I would like to ask you because you have mm -hmm. extensive experience in use of non-invasive modalities such as CT. Yes, well, um, I think uh, CT is uh, something that complements everything that we used to use on a daily basis. Um, starting with the CT, um, well, the first thing that you can do is just have an, a very crude impression on, on the distribution of the calcium. When you use this maximum intensity projection that is just one click in a CT analysis, then you have a gross overview of the calcific distribution. And this is a really good start to then really try to evaluate more in depth lesion calcification on a le lesion level, let's say, um, and then starting to anticipate the need for more dedicated devices. Um, CT can offer us a lot of information. There's a lot of information coming from the lesion length, and this is clearly something that uh, dates from uh, the days when CT was used to, to identify and exclude coronary artery disease. It's a perfect tool to assess lesion length and to assess the normal to normal. But moreover, when you look at the calcific burden, there's a lot of information in, for example, the calcific length, which is an important predictor for our uh, complexity of the procedure, but also on the angle. And CT, for example, is able to detect these calcific rings, which are the most critical, um, well, very often one of the most critical situations that you can encounter during these complex procedures. Yeah, so absolutely. So um, CT can be very good for pre-planning and once we get in the lab, probably intracoronary imaging is still a very useful tool to understand also the pattern of calcification because more and more often we are realizing that not all calcium, not every calcium is equal. So we have different patterns. We have calcified nodules, we have uh, eccentric, concentric, and the behavior can be very different. Also the location in relation to the, um, to the fibrous cap, I mean, if it's thick, if it's superficial, the thickness, many aspects that really influence. But in the end, it's very important is which tool are we gonna use to, to tackle this, this type of calcium? Yes, well, I think CT uh, is complementary. It's not replacing intravascular imaging, especially if you want to assess your uh, post-stent results. Of course, CT is, well, not useless, but it's, uh, it's not the tool that you uh, should, uh, should use. Um, so uh, it will never replace uh, completely the intravascular uh, field or imaging field. Um, I, I agree. Well, the first thing that, that I uh, do as a, as a start is if I have this information that we're dealing with extensive calcium, I'm triggered to use intravascular imaging. And then, of course, the first thing is looking for this crossability of the catheter. This is already an important point. When it crosses all this information that you have pre-processed coming from CT, you can then add some information like, for example, the, the presence of calcified nodules, and then indeed the um, differentiation between superficial and deep calcium, because this will also then trigger decision-making on the exact type of device that you want to use. If you want to use, let's say, intravascular uh, lithotripsy, um, IVL can be used for a more deeper calcium. You want to go for a rotablation uh, because you have a very extensive and long disease. This is triggered by, I think, the combined efforts done by really trying to interpret all this CT information and then adding on top of this 
the classical intravascular imaging. Exactly. So actually, we have a recent consensus uh, of a document of APCI trying mm -hmm. to help us understand which type of device can be more useful for different situations or different types of uh, calcium. And as you mentioned, the first thing is if the lesion is crossable, either with the balloon or with an imaging catheter. This is the first point. So if the lesion is not crossable, of course, we will need to use rotational arthrectomy or laser. These are the two yeah. options, and laser is not available in many labs, so probably rotational arthrectomy is the, is the most preferred option. If the, if, the, if the lesion is crossable, then we have different options here. So what, what is your approach, uh, Kieran? Well, then it depends on, uh, as I have mentioned, uh, the presence of superficial or deep calcium um, and the presence of calcified nodules. If you have these uh, calcified nodules, well, very often um, I even opt for first uh, rotablation strategy, then if necessary, followed by uh, a shock. Um, and this rota shock is uh, also, um, let's say, something complementary. Um, and uh, well, it's a safe procedure. Um, but I think that, well, the armamentarium that you have and all the tools that you have on the shelf um, is something that you will, will have to integrate within this algorithm that is suggested by the Euro4C group and endorsed by the PCR uh, community. Um, and that is really um, a step-by-step -step approach. If the catheter crosses, you go for imaging. If then you cross and you have a very good overview, you can select a good tool. If it doesn't cross, you have to go immediately for rotablation. And then, of course, well, there's also, also the, the, the operator's preference itself um, and, of course, the availability and, the, well, your uh, experience. I think this is also very important. Um, the experience is uh, very often forgotten. If you feel comfortable with rotablation, it's a very uh, convenient and very safe and, um, well, uh, easy-to-use uh, method methodology like IVL, for example. So this all combined is now in a very beautiful algorithm presented by Euro4C Group. Yeah, I agree. I mean, so there is no one, one only option for each type of calcium. There are different tools that can be used. And as you mentioned, this depends on many different aspects. One of them, of course, is the characteristics of the, of the lesion. Also, another one is experience of, of the operator. And in many occasions, as you mentioned, they are complementary. In many occasions, we may need both, uh, both of them. For example, using rota to cross and then using uh, lithotripsy because it's a big vessel and we still need to modify it because with rota, sometimes in big vessels, you, you don't get enough atherectomy, et cetera. So, so I think it's the combination. What is also interesting is, I don't know if you do, but we use a lot of uh, imaging after preparing the plaque to make sure that before you implant a stand, uh, you have prepared properly the plaque because otherwise sometimes there's also another option that is inflating a balloon. But in, in general, I think uh, imaging also offers a lot of information in this, uh, in this moment of after plaque preparation. I completely agree. So this intermediate use uh, just after your first strategy of rotablation or an alternative, um, and then looking for this luminal gain and for the presence of these fractures, um, that is really important because if you identify these fractures, um, well, then I think that you can be pretty convinced that you will have a more or less compliant vessel that will really uh, is well prepared for a stent. If you don't have any uh, fracture and you still remain having this nodular calcification, for example, then you have to go for another run and you have to really try to adapt to the result of this intermediate imaging. Uh, I think it's very important. And we have uh, seen a lot of data from, from the trials. If you have this uh, uh, well-prepared vessel, then you end up with a good stand expansion. And that is uh, the ultimate goal of uh, all these preparation uh, exactly. technologies. And, and exactly. I mean, having a good final stand area is the main predictor of success. So, OK, thank you very much, Jeroen. I think uh, it has been a very interesting discussion. And continue enjoying your PCR. Thank you very much. <laughs>